In this X-Plane modding video, we're going to discuss what textures you need and how to create them for scenery objects. We'll be picking up from the previous video where we covered modeling basics. Make sure you either have your own model ready or have downloaded them from the links in the previous video. When adding color to X-Plane scenery, your goal is to create three different images. Images, which we'll call textures from here on, are composed of four channels, the red, green, blue, and alpha. The first texture is the color and transparency of the surface, called the albedo. The red, green, and blue channels are used to determine the color of the surface. The alpha channel is used to determine if it is transparent or opaque, and is optional. The second texture is the lit texture, or what the object should look like at nighttime with black indicating not lit and any other color variation being what is displayed on the surface. The third texture gets a little more complex due to versions and changes to the lighting pipeline in X-Plane. The closest approximation for the third texture is the normal map. However, it can contain additional information that makes it non-standard, so you just can't use any old normal map. A standard normal map holds vector information about the surface of the object, specifically what direction it points in. The standard is to use the red, green, and blue channel to hold the X, Y, and Z vector data. At the risk of once again getting overly technical, we usually store these vectors in what's referred to as tangent space. And in tangent space, the Z component usually contributes absolutely no information and is pointing out of the surface. Therefore, our Z or blue channel can be used to store other information in addition to our empty alpha channel. We can use this extra storage in two ways, and that depends on whether we are talking about X-Plane 10 or X-Plane 11. In X-Plane 10, the specular level, that is how bright the specular highlight appears, is stored in the alpha channel. You may hear people calling this shininess, but this is not the same as the shininess level used with most other programs and lighting algorithms. Shininess is actually an integer value used in the calculation of the specular highlight to define how tight the highlight is on the surface. In X-Plane, the shininess value is fixed, so don't worry about it. If you decide to make an X-Plane 10 specular map, you must include attr adder underscore shiny underscore rat in the obj file. X-Plane will multiply the value used with adder shiny rat by the specular value in the normal map's alpha channel. If you don't want the value to be modified that you've created in your texture, then use a value of 1.0 in your object file. In X-Plane 11, which supports physically based rendering or PBR, we can use the two extra channels to support metalness and roughness. PBR is great because it mimics how light works in the real world. That is, it conserves energy. In older lighting models, you had an ambient, diffuse, and specular lighting term, which would then be summed together and could potentially create physically impossible lighting solutions, which yield unrealistic visuals. For PBR, the roughness of the object is stored in the alpha channel of the normal map, with zero being the roughest and one being the glossiest. This might seem backwards to you. With a name like roughness, you'd expect one to be the max roughness value. If it helps, you can think of this channel as the inverse of roughness. That is what's called smoothness. A smoothness of zero is very rough, not smooth at all, while a smoothness of one appears very glossy. The reflectance value is stored inside of this blue channel of the normal map. If you plan on creating PBR materials, I recommend you use a program like Substance Painter. Refer back to the first video on how to set up the Substance Painter configuration file to automatically export maps in the correct format. You want to use this configuration file given to us by X-Plane because it does a little funny business with the values that are put in the normal map. Not using the actual roughness in metallic maps, but instead using the glossiness in a map called F0. To make X-Plane understand that you're using the PBR textures, You'll need to add the normal underscore metalness in all caps attribute to activate it on your object. So make sure to include it after you've exported your objects. Now, let's begin texturing our building. 
We're going to tackle texturing this object in reverse order of X-Plane releases, starting with the physically based rendering or PBR workflow for X-Plane 11, then talking about the specular workflow for X-Plane 10. I'm assuming that you have an unwrapped model you're working with that has unique UVs across the surface. If your UVs are not unique, you'll get some issues when we bake our model in Substance Painter. So for instance, if we were to take our UVs here and move them so we have overlapping elements as you can see here, that means that they're going to be sampling from the same location on the texture. Now if you have various effects on your texture that are specific to a certain part, by sharing this color information, you can have some problems. And this happens a lot with things like ambient occlusion baking and a few other objects as well. So if you were to paint on that surface, you'd actually be painting across two different parts of the surface at the same time. And that might not be what you want. Now you can use this in a good way. And that is if you were to take say the window, you'll notice we have lots of small windows all over the place. And that means each window is going to be unique, but we could take all of the windows for instance, and put them all in the exact same space, being a lot more careful than I am right here using some of the tools. In which case, now I've got more space, so I could scale those windows up. Now I could have them take up a lot larger area. And that means there'd be more texture on that object, more pixels, more texels as we call it, uh, giving it a higher resolution. The problem is each window would look the same and across a building like this with all those different windows, you would notice it tile up a lot very quickly. Now you could also maybe make four different windows and have them randomly assigned all over and that's completely up to you. For right now though, I'm gonna make each window unique. Now before we export, we're going to need to add a new material to our object. A material is just a container holding the shader code and a reference to all the textures and parameters it needs to tell it what to do. If you don't create a new material, you'll get the default material name and property when you export. Try to use a default or simple type of material, names such as Lambert, Blend, and Foam, since we don't care about how it looks in the 3D application anyway. Now I have an old convention I used from my early days in Maya, where I named the material after the object's name. You did remember to name your object, correct? I add the suffix underscore M to indicate that this is a material. Now, before we export, you need to take a look at your project and clear your outliner and any old history that might be hanging around. For instance, over here on the side in my editor, I can see that I have all of these different poly tweaks where I manipulated the UVs of the object. Now, the reason why it's important to delete your history is sometimes when you export assets out, it doesn't always get the latest history. So it's a good idea to commit all these changes to the object. One thing to always make sure of is to check your outliner or whatever version of an outliner you have inside of your program and take a look inside. As you can see here, I actually have several different layers before we get to the surface of my object, that is the actual polygonal object. Therefore, I'm gonna get rid of these excess transforms. What you'll also note is that I did not name my object, or if I had, while I was doing so many different transforms on this object, regrouping, editing, I lost that name at some point. So why don't we go through and make this work? First, I'm gonna go ahead and rename my object to building. Then I'm gonna drag it out of my hierarchy all the way up to the top. And let's go ahead and delete those excess transforms. And now we have the building all by itself. Another important thing besides history is making sure that you apply your transforms. So for instance, if I look at my transforms, the translate, rotate, and scale, I'll notice that all my translates are zero, my rotates are zero, and my scales are all one. If you have different values in this, you need to apply them so that your object is in a neutral pose, as we call it. That is, you don't know what kind of transforms are gonna be applied to it, and you don't really wanna save any of that information when you bring it into another program. So it's better to just zero everything out and make the scale equal to one. Now, Substance Painter can import a huge range of different file formats, so you're bound to find one that your program can export out. I'll specifically be using the FBX format, as it's the file format that I'll be using to transfer my model into Blender once we're finished texturing. But you need to be careful about the FBX version you decide to export if you're using an older version of Blender. As you can see under the Advanced tab in Maya, you can select the version number, which strongly correlates to a specific year. Odds are, if you're using an older version of Blender, such as 2.78 or 2.79, you're going to want to use something that's a little older, like this 2014-2015 version of FBX. Don't worry, we're just moving polygonal data around. You shouldn't lose anything by using an older format. Now my personal convention is to create a folder called SP and three folders inside of it. One for my FBX files, which I export out into Substance Painter. One for my Substance Saves, which I just call Sub or Substance. And then one for the actual texture files I export out of Substance Painter to be used by Blender. In Substance Painter, go to File, New. 
Use the PBR metallic roughness template for now. We'll talk about transparency in a later video. Press the select button to navigate to your exported file. Choose a working document resolution that won't stress your computer's hardware. Remember, we can always crank this value up at export time to something crazy like 4096 or beyond if necessary. Also, remember to choose the OpenGL normal map format and press OK. All right, we're not gonna go in depth into Substance Painter and all the different tools. That's something you can find in another video. But what's important to note is that if you use the F1, F2, and F3 keys, it allows you to switch between seeing the 3D, 2D view, as well as just the 3D or the 2D view. Typically, I like to work in the 3D view and I can get most things done, but there are some steps you need to take into consideration before you start making anything to make sure you don't mess stuff up. Here's my personal mental checklist to go through before wasting time texturing if there's something wrong. First, I look at the 2D UV layout and to see if there's anything strange such as UVs overlapping or crossovers. If you imported your model without UVs, the latest version of Substance Painter, as of Feb 2020, will have created UVs automatically for you. If you see any problems, you can always fix it. Re-export the FBX and then go to Edit Project Configuration and reload the file. Just make sure you also rebake any textures. More on that shortly. The next check is to test our texture set list at the top, right here. You should only have one material if you're following my advice. If you fail to assign that material to all parts of your model, you might see more than one. Go back to your 3D modeling program and fix your materials. Now, if you made changes to the materials you have on your model when you re-imported it, you're going to notice that your texture set list changed. Here, I got rid of that Fong 1, and I've replaced everything with building underscore M. Now, you can leave it like this, but if that little value there annoys you, we can go under Settings and Reassign Texture Sets. Here, we can see Fong 1, and we can just choose to remove that. Go ahead and hit Apply, and now it's gone. Now's the most important step, and one that almost everyone forgets to do early on in their project, and that is baking your textures so that Substance Painter can use that information to create impressive sets of materials. Go under Texture Set Settings, scroll down slightly, and click Bake Mesh Maps. Now, baking is per material, but if you do have multiple materials in your object for some reason, you get a third button right here in the center that would say Bake All. For right now, since we're only using one, we've got one button over here called Bake Building Underscore Mesh. Don't worry too much about all this information. What's important to understand is that baking produces several maps that the different materials in Substance Painter will use to drive how they look. For instance, things like the curvature or the thickness of the object might determine how different parts of the material are set up or if they're eroded away with different masks. I just go ahead and leave everything checked for now. You might get an error on the ID channel since we haven't set anything up, but it's okay, everything will work anyway. Go ahead and press Bake Building M Mesh Maps. The next step is to make it so that we can create our lit texture, which is called Emissive in Substance Painter. In Texture Set Settings, under Channels, you'll notice we have several of them already chosen for us, such as the Albedo Color, Height, Roughness, Metallic, and Normal, and all of these have different sizes. Go ahead and hit the plus button and scroll down to Emissive. Emissive is sRGB8. What you need to understand there is that we have color information stored in our emissive map, which means you can color and paint your windows anything you want them to be at nighttime. Now we need to apply materials to our object. We're not gonna take a whole lot of time, just get some basic ones down on the surface. If you're an artist, you can spend hours crafting this object and making it look incredibly unique. So let's go into the layers tab and choose from the different materials we have. Now, most likely I'm gonna have materials that you don't have access to. However, if you go on Substance Source and you happen to have a subscription, you'll be able to find multiple different materials that you can use for your project. There are many ones such as brick and glass that work very well for different objects. First, I'm gonna type brick into my shelf to try to search for something that will look appropriate. In this case, we can go with an older brick here or we can go with a newer brick as you can see right there. So after you've selected your material to use, go ahead and grab it, drag it over to your layers panel and let go. Our material is going to look pretty bad at first, and that's because it's applying it in UV space. That is, that checkerboard is being applied across the entire UV space in 2D. What we want is for it to apply it in three-dimensional space. Under Projection, UV Projection, change this to Triplanar Projection. Much better, but the scale's a little wonky. So now go under Scale in UV Transforms and change it up to something respectable, maybe 20. Maybe a little high, maybe 15. That's not bad. 
Now once again, there's the whole trade-off here of how much UV space you have available versus the kind of resolution you're going to get on your object, where the surface of the brick building doesn't get a whole lot of pixels. Therefore, each of these don't look great. We could go in and change how the UVs are laid out if we wanted to, which might fix some of these things. Or we could make the building out of multiple materials and export them as separate object files. These are all possible solutions. Now, as we noted before, each of these sequences are pretty much the exact same geometry, which means we could stack these UVs on top of each other and then create a much larger texture of brick that would look much better across the entire object. However, it would no longer be unique. By making it unique, we can go in here and apply different effects, such as weathering effects. If we went to rust, for instance, and just dragged and dropped that over here, we could use one of these smart masks to make this a little bit more interesting. So rust by itself is probably not a good choice, but if we go down under rust color and maybe dirty that up a bit and make it a darker color, and then we go under UV projection, make that triplanar projection, and scale that up as well, maybe to four, we get a nice color variation across the surface. Then we can go under our smart masks and begin applying ones that make sense for a building. Maybe the street is a lot dirtier and that's where most of the soot and so forth accumulate. Therefore, we can go to our ground dirt mask and apply that to the object there. In which case, now we only have that information at the bottom. Now, had you reused UVs over here, this part would be applied to all segments that you reused, which could look wrong. So there are advantages and disadvantages to reusing your UV space or using unique UVs everywhere. So this is looking a little extreme, so we might want to go to 100 here and crank that down a little bit, just so it has a little tiny bit of influence on the surface. Or we could go into the mask editor itself and begin customizing how it interacts with the surface. We can change how it blurs. We can change its contrast to make it more pronounced. Or its balance, which is how far up the surface it'll actually go, as you can see here. You can also add multiple materials of different types if you wanted to. For instance, let's talk about that glass. I'm going to type glass in here and see what are available for me. We've got clear, colored, hammered, rain, and scale. Scale might work, so let's try that one. You probably don't have access to these if you're using the standard version of Substance Painter, by the way. So you might need to use something else, maybe a different kind of surface that's polished. Now the problem is that this is being applied to the entire object. Also a problem is that the normals and the height information from the Rust and the Cambridge combined layer are affecting our windows. There are two solutions to this problem. One involves a mask. We could go to our Cambridge combined, right click, add a white mask, and then only have those areas that we want brick to be on selected. So I can come over here to this tool, which is our polygon fill tool, and then go up here to individual polygons and select only the ones that matter. Now nothing happened because I have white selected. I want black. Black means that it will not be added. I can click on these. You'll notice that that information is disappearing. And if you look over here at this tab, you'll see that right there at the top, it turned black, indicating that these windows now have a black applied to that mask, meaning that all of its information will be culled and not rendered in that layer. Now that's one way, but we'd have to apply that both to the Cambridge Combined and the Rust Fine. But we already have a layer on there, and then that means combining multiple masks, and well, why deal with that? So let's undo that. Instead of using a mask here, what I can do is on scale, I can use a mask here only on the windows, and I can make sure that it excludes any of the normal and height information from layers below it. So first, let's make that mask. So I'm going to go to add a black mask. Now selection over here is a little bit difficult. I have to click each window individually, as you can see here, and that can take a while. However, when I laid out my UVs, you'll notice that almost all the windows are up here at the top, making selection a lot easier doing it this way. So we can go through here and just start selecting all the windows that I see. And there we are. And I think that's almost all of them. A few more down on this side. Now all the windows have been selected. Oh, missed one or two here and there but we're still seeing that brick normal and height information coming through. So if we go to glass scale formation, now if we click on this object here, it allows us to choose which of the different channels we're manipulating. I want to go and set from base color to height. And you'll notice here that it's set to linear dodge. I'm going to set that to replace instead. I'm going to go to normal and also set that from this normal combine method to replace as well. Now this will only work if this material has that channel activated. So right here you'll notice that height is turned off. If I turn that on, you'll notice that all the height information disappears from that surface because it is overriding anything on a prior level below it. Now this white color doesn't work very well for us. So instead, let's go under the glass color and choose something dark that you would expect a window to be somewhere down there. 
Now, in a perfect world, this would be reflecting different kinds of information from the scene, and that all depends on X-Plane and how it is set up. Now, you'll notice the scale is kind of wonky as well, and we've also got the streaks going all kinds of different directions. So let's go ahead and turn that to triplanar, so at least they're all going in the same direction, and we're going to crank that scale way up to maybe something like 20. Now, at that point, they're all looking kind of the same, so it might be a better idea to maybe reduce that down to something like 10, so they're a little bit different. Now's the time where you can have some fun. If you want to, you can look up different kinds of materials. So for instance, we could look up stone, and then maybe here's a, a castle wall, or maybe some rubble or sand or smooth limestone. And you could start going in here and adding all these different materials to different parts of your object, using masks as before to mask out different regions, and selecting only those that make sense. So for instance, if I wanted to have a nice little kind of a top and bottom to each of these elements, I can only select these parts of my polygons. Now we need a roof of some sort, so we can look up maybe a, a black color or a slate color or maybe asphalt. Do I have any asphalts? Let's see, I've got concrete, so we could use a concrete. I also have an oil asphalt, which might look interesting. But let's just choose a standard concrete, so let's see what we have. We're going to increase the size of these to large. And we've got a dusty concrete, or we have this concrete linear gray, which might look nice as well. Let's go ahead and add that to our surface. Once again, let's go to triplanar projection and increase the scale to maybe something like, I don't know, eight. So we get a number of those different panels. And on our mask, we're gonna add a black mask. And because the roof elements were kept together, I can actually use, instead of selecting by polygon, as you can see here, which is kind of a pain, I could go by UVs, which is right over here. So I can select this entire element as one entire group very, very quickly and efficiently. Now that top looks a little pronounced. That is the normal intensity of it. And you can always dial all these things down. And this is where the art comes in and you can take as long as you want to. But I'm gonna go under my concrete linear gray and go under advanced parameters. And I'm gonna start looking at some of the different options. So one of these things is I'm gonna darken that color a bit. So there we go, that's a little bit nicer. And we can also go in here and increase the number of tiles, maybe add some more stains to the surface as well. Really important parameter is under basic parameters and that is the normal intensity. I can dial that down a little bit so it's not showing so much. Same thing with the height. Let's go ahead and dial down that height range a bit. And you'll notice that that softened up some of those different shadows on the surface. Now, a problem is that I'm still seeing the brick through this surface. And of course, I can go on here and go to my normal layer and change that to replace, and then my height layer and also change that to replace. And now that brick is all gone. And now really, it's up to you to complete this object. Go through your materials, find interesting stuff, so for instance, let's see, we've got barnacle covered stone. We could add that to the surface, for instance, crank up and make triplanar, something like that. Really probably reduce the uh, normals on that surface. That's way too intense. So way reduce that down a lot right there and uh, reduce that height range as well. And then maybe go to our smart masks and find something like maybe a dust or dirt or something and see what it does for our surface. So we could, for instance, take our saturation, our lumi luminosity, I can decrease that tremendously, and now we get more of a gritty, dirty feel across the surface. Somewhere around there, we can increase our contrast if we want to. Probably want to increase the scale quite a bit more as well, because that normal information you can see on those windows is causing some issues. You might also want to remove this from the window elements, or this could have been just a really bad uh, smart mask to use on the surface. So instead we can go in here and find dirt spots, dirt splashes. It's really about you sitting down and playing with this program and finding out something that works for you. Let's go to surface worn instead. And there we get it all over the place, which might look interesting if we crank those values up a little bit. So let's go back and crank up the luminosity again. And now we've got sort of this green patchiness that could, instead of being barnacles, we might want to go in here, find a material. Do we have anything with leaves in it? Leaves or dead uh, jungle forest. We could come to this layer and replace this material with that one instead. And in doing so, we'll get this different kind of layout on that surface. We can also add multiple layers to our mask. So I can right click on the mask and let's do a paint layer, for instance. Now I'm going to go to my uh, polygon selection and I can go over here and start removing these windows from that selection by choosing the color of black and going through here and making that selection over here because it's a lot easier in the 2D mode than it is in the 3D mode to make our object look a little bit more weathered. We are, and I believe there were a couple little stragglers right there and right there. Now, the grass does not influence any of those areas, as you can see, except for a few windows, which I kind of missed, but we can always add them back. Now, after you spend some time manipulating your model and getting it to look nice, 
Now is the time for us to go ahead and add our lit information to the surface. So I wanna go ahead and create a new fill layer. And this fill layer, I'm just gonna call lit. Now down here, I'm going to scroll to material and I wanna turn off everything except for emission because that's the only thing I wanna be manipulating. And under material, I'm actually gonna go over here and turn on emissive, which shows you what your object looks like only on that particular channel. Now, as you can see here, our building has no emissive information, no lit information, it will be completely black at night. Now what we can do is change this color to white instead. And I'm gonna right click on this and let's add a black mask, in wh which means nothing is going to be shown. We can go through now and start selecting the different elements that we want to be lit up. So here I'm lighting up all the different windows. Once again, this would be a lot better if we went in 2D mode and did this in here. So now all of our windows will be shown as lit up. Now it might be a good idea if we want to, to add another layer, we'll call this also lit background. And I'm going to turn off everything except for emission and make that black. Now you can see what you end up with here. Now you might want these windows to look a little bit more interesting than just a flat white object. In which case you could always go to lit and instead change the color to something else. So maybe make it a little bit more yellow to indicate some indoor lighting. You could also go to the mask itself and try manipulating that. So for instance, let's try a few things. Go under filter and go to bevel, which gives us some interesting shading around the sides. You could also smoothen that as well, which gives us some more in interesting information from one layer to the next. So if you wanna dirty things up and add some uniqueness to your building, we can because we are not reusing any UVs. So we can add a new fill layer, for instance, turn off everything but emissive again, and let's go to one of these smart masks over here and just choose maybe dirt splashes and throw it on the surface. And maybe we should scale that up a bit if we wanted to. So we can come over here and let's scale that up, I don't know, maybe five. Let's come over here maybe, and we can go to one of these grunge maps and maybe scale it up maybe three times on one, maybe, uh, five times on the other, I don't know, whatever looks right. And then if it's if it's a little bit too much, maybe you want to smooth things out, we can always go back in, add a filter on top of it, and then blur that layer as well. And now we get things to be a little bit less harsh, but, but add some non-uniformity to each of those windows. Heck, if you wanted to, you could come up here and draw out a helicopter pad or some kind of a symbol or something else you want to on the surface. So let's go ahead and add maybe a giant arrow to the top of the surface. So we'll add a new, um, let's go to lit, mask and add a new paint surface and we'll add a uh, a big old arrow right here at the top that might be a bit much so why don't we uh, crank that down a bit on the color and we'll just have an arrow right here something like that and with that, we have our emissive or lit channel. Let's go back now to just material. And what you'll notice is that when you have material on, it's gonna show both the lit and non-lit on at the same time. So just be careful about that. One way to keep yourself from having to see this is by creating a new folder, for instance, and just calling it lit, and then taking all of your lit textures and putting them inside of that, and then turning this off whenever you don't need it. All right, so we have an interesting dirty building. So let's go to file, export textures, and under config, we're going to change from PBR metal roughness to X plane. Now, if we open up the texture set spot right here, you'll notice we get an albedo, normal, and lit. But more importantly is, if we go under the configuration tab and go under X plane, it'll match what I talked about earlier in the theory. That is, we're getting the RGB purple base color information here. We're getting the alpha opacity information stored here. Now, in here, in the normal map, we're getting R and G coming from this normal OpenGL format that we set up before. B, however, is coming from this F0, and A is coming from the glossiness channel. And finally, our lit texture is coming directly from this emissive input map you see right there. Go ahead and navigate to your folder hierarchy. For me, it's under my textures folder. I'm gonna create a new folder inside of that and call this building. Inside of building, I'm gonna go ahead and select it, and I'm gonna choose export. I'm gonna choose open folder after that. Here you can see we've exported our three maps out successfully. We have the albedo channel, the lit channel, and the normal channel. One final thing we're gonna do before we end this video is in case you're interested in getting this X-Plane format to actually work with X-Plane 10, where we have a specular map. It's really easy to do this. All you need to do is take the X-Plane config you already have and press this button up here to make a copy of it. I'm gonna go ahead, press F2, and change this name to X-Plane 10. 
Now I need to change the normal map part of this export. Specifically, the R, G, and B part need to be the normal OpenGL converted map, and the alpha needs to come from the specular converted map. Very easy to make this change. Just go over to normal map, click and drag it over here, and choose from the blue channel. And now you'll see all three of them are green to coincide with the normal OpenGL converted map. Now click on the specular one, drag it over, and just say gray channel. Now you have the specular information being embedded within the alpha channel of this particular map. Now when we export this out, it'll be using the X-Plane 10 format. As a reminder, for X-Plane 11 with the PBR pipeline, you're going to be using the normal metalness keyword. However, if you're targeting X-Plane 10, it's going to be using that shiny rat attribute. In the next video, we're going to go into Blender, load in our FBX file, and then using the X-Plane plugin, we're going to make references to all the different textures for our object export that out, bring it into World Builder, place it at a location, and then bring it in X-Plane. See you all then. So long, goodbye.